one point, the driver said, for God's sake, you're rocking the boat back there. Actually, we were. The car was swaying as Neil and I both swayed to the rhythm of the it, of our final excited joy in talking and living to the blank, tranced end of all particulars that had been lurking in our souls all our lives. Oh, man, 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 <laughs> moaned Neil. And it's not even the beginning of it. And now here we are at last going east together. We've never gone east together. Jack, think of it. We'll dig Denver together and see what everybody's doing, although that matters little to us. The point being that we know what it is and we know time and we know that everything is really fine. Then he whispered, clutching my sleeve, sweating. Now you just dig them up front. They have worries. They're counting the miles. They're thinking about where to sleep tonight, how much money for gas, the weather, how they'll get there, and all the time they'll, they'll get there. Anyway, you see, but they need to worry. Their souls really won't be at peace unless they can latch on to an established and proven worry. And having once found it, they assume facial expressions to fit and go with it, which is, you see, unhappiness. A false, a really false expression of concern and even dignity. And all the time, it all flies by them. And they know it too. And that too worries them no end. Listen, listen. Well now, he mimicked them. I don't know. Maybe we should go get gas in this station. I read recently in a petroleum magazine that that kind of gas has a great deal of gook in it. And uh, someone once told me that it even had some loon in it. And I don't know. Well, I just don't feel like it anyway. Man, you dig all this. He was poking me furiously in the ribs to understand. And I tried my wildest best. Bing, bang. It was all yes, yes, yes in the back seat. And the people up front were mopping their brows with fright and wished they'd never picked us up at the travel bureau. It was only the beginning, too. After a wasted night in Sacramento, the guy driving, shyly bought a room in a hotel and invited Neil and I to come up for a drink while the couple went to sleep at relatives. And in the hotel room, Neil tried everything in the books to get money from the guy, submitting, finally, to his advances while I hid in the bathroom and listened. It was insane. The guy began by saying he was very glad we had come along because he liked young men like us. And would we believe it? But he really didn't like girls and had recently concluded an affair with a man in Frisco in which he had taken the male role and the man, the female role. Neil plied him with a business-like questions and nodded eagerly. And the guy said he would like nothing better but to know what Neil thought about all this. Warning him first that he had once been a hustler in his youth, Neil proceeded to handle the guy like a woman, tipping him over legs in the air and all, and gave him a monstrous huge banging. I was so nonplussed, all I could do was sit and stare from my corner, and after all the trouble, the guy turned over no money to us. Though he made vague promises for Denver, and on top he became extremely sullen, and I think suspicious of Neil's final motives. He kept counting his money and checking on his wallet. Neil threw, his, threw up his hands and he gave up. He said, you see, man, it's better not to bother. Give them what they secretly want. And they, of course, immediately become panic stricken. But he had sufficiently conquered the owner of the Plymouth to take over the wheel without remonstration. And now we really traveled. We left Sacramento at dawn and we were crossing the Nevada desert by dune after a hurling passage of the Sierras that made the, the driver and the tourists all cling to each other in the back seat. We were in front. We took over. Neil was happy again. All he needed was a wheel in his hand and four on the road. He talked about how bad a driver Bill Burroughs was. And so to demonstrate, <laughs> whenever a huge big truck like that one come come looming into it in sight, we would take Bill infinite time to spot it. Because he couldn't see, man. He, ca he can't see. And he rubbed his eyes furious to show. And I'd say, whoop, look out, Bill, a truck. And he'd say, hey, uh, what's that you say, Neil? Truck, truck. And at the very last moment, he would go up to the truck like this. And Neil hurled the Plymouth head on at the truck, roaring our way, wobbled and hovered in front of it a moment. 
the truck driver's face growing white before our eyes, the people in the back seat subsiding and gasps of horror and swung away and the last moment, like that, you see, exactly like that. That's how bad he was. I wasn't scared at all. I knew Neil. The people in the back seat were speechless. In fact, they were afraid to complain. God knows what Neil would do, they thought, if they should ever complain. He bawled right across the desert in this manner, demonstrating various ways of how not to drive, how his father used to drive jalopies, how great drivers made curves, how bad drivers hover over too far in the beginning and had to scramble at curve's end, and so on. It was a hot, sunny afternoon. Reno, Battle Mountain, Elko, all the towns along Nevada Road shot by one after another, and at dusk, we were in the Salt Lake Flats with the lights of Salt Lake City, infinitesimally glittering almost a hundred miles across the mirage of the flats, twice showing above and below the curve of the earth, one clear, one dim. I told Neil that the thing that bound us all together in this world was invisible, and to prove it, pointed to the long lines of telephone poles that curved on out of sight over the bend of a hundred miles of salt his floppy bandage all dirty now, shuddered in the air, his face was light. Oh, yes, man, dear God, yes, yes, yes. And suddenly he collapsed. I turned and saw him huddled over in the corner. He was sleeping. His face was down on his good hand and the bandaged hand automatically and dutifully remained in the air. The people in the front seat sighed with relief. I heard them whispering mutiny. We can't let him drive anymore. He's absolutely crazy. They must have let him out of an asylum or something. I rose to Neil's defense and leaned forward to talk to them. He's not crazy. He'll be all right. And don't worry about his driving. He's the best in the world. I just can't stand it, said the girl with a suppressed hysterical whisper. I sat back and enjoyed a nightfall on the desert and waited for the poor child angel Neil to wake up again. He woke up just as we, we were on a hill overlook, overlooking Salt Lake City's neat patterns of light. The tourist wanted to see a famous hospital up there and opened his eyes to the place in this spectral world where he was born unnamed and bedraggled years ago. Jack, 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 this, this is where I was born. Think of it. People change. They eat meals year after year and change with every meal. Yee, look, he was so excited it made me cry. Where would it all lead? The tourists insisted on driving the car the rest of the way to Denver. Okay, we didn't care. We sat back and talked. In any case, they got too tired in the morning and Neil took the wheel in the eastern Colorado desert at Craig. We spent almost the entire night crawling cautiously over Strawberry Pass in Utah and lost immeasurable time. They went to sleep. Neil headed pell-mell for the mighty wall of Bertoud Pass that stood a hundred miles ahead on the roof of the world. A tremendous Gibraltarian door shrouded in clouds. He took the Bertoud Pass like a duck on a June bug, same as Tehachapi, cutting off the motor, floating it, passing everybody, and never halting the rhythmic advance that the mountains themselves intended till we overlooked the great hot plain of Denver again as I'd first seen it after Central City with the kids and Neil was home. It was with a great deal of silly relief that these people let us off the car at the corner of 27th and Federal. Our battered suitcases were piled on the sidewalk again. We had longer ways to go, but no matter, the road is life. Now we had a number of circumstances to deal with in Denver and they were of an entirely different order than 1947. We could either get T a TB car at once, or stay a few days for kicks and look for his father. We decided this. My idea was for Neil and I to live at the house of the woman who had given me the money to go to Frisco. But Justin Brierly knew we were coming through together and had already warned her against Jack's friend from Frisco. And so when I called on the phone, First thing from the gas station where we left off, she immediately made it known to me that she wouldn't have anything to do with Neil in her house. 
When I told Neil this, he instantly realized that he was back in the same old Denver that he'd never given up any quarter. For in Frisco, at least he had found himself a hometown where he was treated like everyone else. In Denver, his reputation was too much. I racked my brain for what to do. I, I finally hit on the idea of having Neil stay at the home of some Okies I knew out on Alameda Boulevard, where I'd live briefly with my family and I would stay with my woman. A darkness came across Neil's face and from the moment on in Denver, that moment on in Denver, he reverted to his youthful days of violence and bitterness. It was him against Denver as long as we were there. When I fully understood this, I left the woman's house and went to live with Neil at the Oki woman's house. And even then, my watchfulness had little effect. First things first, we decided before I went to the woman's house to eat and have a last brief talk in the restaurant. We were both exhausted and dirty. In the john, I was taking a leak in the urinal and stepped out before I was finished and aimed into the other urinal, <laughs> momentarily uh, halting the flow and saying to Neil, dig this trick. Yes, man, it's very good. It's a good trick, but awful on your kidneys. And because you're getting a little older now, every time you do this, eventually years of misery in your old age, awful kidney miseries for the days when you sit in the parks. It makes me mad. Who's old? I'm not much older than you are. I wasn't saying that, man. Ah, shit. I said, you're always making cracks about my age. I'm no old dude like that, that guy in the hotel. You don't have to warn me about my kidneys. We went back to the booth, and just as the waitress set down the hot roast beef sandwiches and where ordinarily Neil would have leaped to wolf the food down at once, I said to cap my anger, and I don't want to hear about it anymore. And suddenly, Neil's eyes grew tearful, and he got up and left his food steaming there and walked out of the restaurant. And I wondered if he was just wandering off forever. I didn't care. I was so mad. I had flipped momentarily and turned it down on Neil, but the sight of his uneaten food made me sadder than anything in years. I shouldn't have said that. He likes to eat so much. He's never left his food like this. What the hell? Nah, it's showing him anyway. Neil stood outside the restaurant for exactly five minutes and then came back and sat down. Well, I said, what were you doing out there? Knotting up your fists, cursing me, thinking up new gags about my kidneys? Neil mutely shook his head. No, nah, man. No, nah, man. You're all completely wrong. If you want to know, well, go ahead, tell me. I said all this and I never looked up for my food. I felt like a beast. I was crying, said Neil. Ah, oh, hell, you never cry. You say that? Why do you think I don't cry? You don't die enough to cry. Every one of these things I said was a knife at myself. Everything I had ever secretly held against Neil was coming out. How ugly I was and what filth I was discovering in the depths of my own impure psychologies. Neil was shaking his head. No, man, I was crying. Go on. I bet you were so mad you had to leave. Believe me, Jack. Really do believe me. If you ever believed anything about me, I knew he was telling the truth. And yet, I didn't want to bother with him the truth. And when I looked up at him, I think I was cockeyed from cracked intestinal twistings in my awful soul. And then I knew I was wrong. Oh man, Neil, I'm sorry. I never acted this way before with you. Well, now you know me. You know, I don't have close relationships with anybody much. I don't know what to do with these things. I hold these things in my hand like they were pieces of turd and don't know where to put it down. Let's forget it. The holy con man began to eat. It's not my fault. It's not my fault, I told him. Nothing in this lousy world is my fault. Don't you see that? I don't want it to be and it can't be and it won't be. Yes, man, yes. But please, hearken back and believe me. I do believe you. This was the sad story of the afternoon. All kinds of tremendous complications arose that night when Neil went to stay with the Oakley, Oakey family. These had been neighbors of mine. The mother was a wonderful woman in jeans who drove trucks to support her kids, five in all. Her husband having left her years before when they were traveling around the country in a trailer. They had rolled all the way from Indiana to LA in that trailer. After many a good time and a big Sunday afternoon drunk in his Crossroads bars and laughter and guitar playing in the night and the big lout had suddenly walked off across the dark field and never returned. 
Her children were wonderful. The eldest was a boy who wasn't around that summer, but in camp for delinquent kids in the mountains. Next was a lovely 14-year-old daughter who wrote poetry and picked flowers in the fields and wanted to grow up and be an actress in Hollywood, Nancy by name. Then came the little ones, little Billy who sat around the campfire at night and cried for his pea tater before it was half roasted. And little Sally who made pets of worms, horny toads, beetles, and anything that crawled and gave them names and places to live. They had four dogs. They lived their ragged and joyous lives on the little new settlement street where my house had been and where the butt of our neighbor's semi-respectable sense of propriety only because of the poor woman's husband had left her and because they littered up the yard like humans. At night, all the lights of Denver lay like a great wheel on the plain below for the house was in that part of the west where the mountains roll down foothilling to the plain and where in primeval times soft waves must have washed from sea-like Mississippi to make such round and perfect stools for the island peaks like Bertoud and Terrible Pike and Estes Mount. Neil went there, and of course he was all sweats and joy at the sight of them, especially Nancy, but I warned him not to touch her and probably didn't have to. The woman was a great man's woman and took it, took to Neil right away, but she was bashful and he was bashful, and the result was an uproaring beer drinking in the littered living room and music on the phonograph, the complications rose like clouds of butterflies. The woman, Johnny everyone called her, was finally about to buy a jalopy, as she had been threatening to do for years and had recently come into a few bucks towards one. Meanwhile, remember, I was loyaling, lolling at the woman's house and drinking scotch. Neil immediately took over the responsibility of selecting and naming the price of the car because, of course, he wanted to use it himself. So as of yore, he could go picking up girls right out of high school in the afternoons and drive them up to the mountains. Poor innocent Oki Johnny was always agreeable to anything. The following afternoon, Neil called up from the country and said, man, I don't want to bother you, but I swear and swear my shoes are no longer wearable. I absolutely need another pair of shoes. What shall we do? By a wonderful coincidence, I had a pair of old shoes sitting around Clementine's chest. I said to her, holding the phone, listen, Neil absolutely needs some, needs some shoes. I'm gonna give him the old pair. How about letting him come over and pick him up? No, definitely no, she said. And how forewarned can you get? But we agreed that I could meet him at the corner down the street and hand them over. Yeah, so yes, said Neil, sensing all this. And he hinged in from the country and met me a half an hour later on the corner. It was a beautiful, warm, sunny afternoon. <laughs>